Hi there. This is the third in a series of three videos on semiconductors. In it, I'll be talking about the light emitting diode and the solar cell, and how to explain their operation in terms of energy bands. Let's get started with the light emitting diode, or LED. The symbol for an LED is the same as the PN junction diode, except for one thing, these two arrows pointing outwards, which signify the light being emitted or released. Now, we saw in the last video how a PN junction operates when forward biased. It's important to remember then that an LED is basically just a PN junction which emits light when forward biased. That is, when the negative terminal of a battery is connected to the N type side and the positive terminal to the P type side. Normally, LEDs are protected from large currents by placing a resistor in series with them, but I've not included that in this diagram. The design of an LED is actually quite fascinating. Within an LED of diameter 5 mm, that's a fairly common size of LED, the semiconductor die is only a fraction of a millimetre in width. It sits within a tiny reflecting cup, which ensures that the light is reflected in the desired direction. The device is contained within an epoxy case, which also acts as a lens. Now, here's the important thing we need to know for higher physics. When the LED is forward biased, electrons within the conduction band of the n-type semiconductor move towards the conduction band of the p-type. Also, holes within the valence band of the p-type move towards the valence band of the n-type. Within the junction, electrons drop from the conduction band to the valence band and recombine with holes. When an electron recombines with a hole, a photon of light is emitted, as shown in the animation. Now, you might have a question which asks you to calculate the wavelength or frequency of the light emitted by the LED. This depends on the band gap. That's the energy between the valence band and the conduction band. To calculate the photon's frequency, we just use this equation, where E is the band gap in joules, H is Planck's constant, which is found in the data sheet at the front of the exam, and F is frequency in hertz. To calculate wavelength, we then use the wave equation, V equals F lambda, where V is the speed of light in air, 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second, again in the data sheet. F is frequency, and lambda is wavelength in meters. If you're asked to determine the actual color of the light emitted by the LED, then all you have to do is to compare your calculated wavelength with those given in the data sheet. Next up is the solar cell. Before I talk about the solar cell, I'd like to mention this component, the photodiode. Like the solar cell, it's an example of what's called a photovoltaic device. The photodiode has two modes of operation. Firstly, when reverse biased, remember that's connecting the negative terminal of a battery to the p-type side and the positive terminal to the n-type side. The photodiode operates in the photoconductive mode. Now we don't need to know about this in higher physics, so I'll go straight on to the second mode of operation, photovoltaic. You'll see from the diagram that in photovoltaic mode, the photodiode is not biased. In other words, it's not connected to a power supply. When light shines in the photodiode, energy from a photon of light can excite an electron from the valence band into the conduction band, creating an EMF. This is the basis for how solar cells operate, so let's see it in action. Looking at the circuit diagram, you'll see the symbol for a solar cell with a voltmeter connected across it to measure the output voltage, or EMF. The question is though, how does it work? So, when a photon of energy greater than the band gap of the semiconductor strikes the PN junction, it can excite an electron from the valence band into the conduction band. You'll have seen that a hole is also left in the valence band. The electron moves to the conduction band of the N type and the hole moves to the valence band of the p-type. The separation of the charges creates an EMF. This is known as the photovoltaic effect. If the light source was moved closer to the solar cell, then a greater number of photons would strike the solar cell per second, resulting in a greater separation of charges as more electron-hole pairs are produced. A greater EMF would therefore be measured in the voltmeter. I'll not go into it here, because it's not required knowledge, but the design of a solar cell is also very interesting. The silicon crystal is very reflective, so it has to be coated so that sufficient photons enter the PN junction. Also, the P-type layer is extremely thin, around one micrometer to prevent... Oh, hold on. I said I wouldn't mention it here. Anyway, after watching these three videos, you should have a better understanding of doping, the formation of PN junctions, and their applications. 
even if you don't share my interest in them. That's us for now though. For more information on upcoming videos, summary sheets and so on, visit physics-podcast.co.uk. Thank you for listening.